Uravani Pacharadi and Yugasheshi Shunyavani Pashachadi Shakam. Gita Rita Chayena Vibhakti Bhavi and Chayasa Vibhishastra Purana Nita Nita Nisa Nisha. Studying the Bhagavad Gita says with great faith in the ocean essence of all the knowledges revealed. The name we're reading from the Sriman Bhagavad Gita is Chapter 18, Perfection of Renunciation, Text Number 16. Svabhavadena kaunteya nivakta sena karmana kartum nechasi yanmoha kurishasi yavasho pitakt. Please repeat, Svabhava Yena. Svabhava Yena. Born of your own nature. Born of your own nature. Kaunteya. Kaunteya. O son of Kunti. O son of Kunti. Nibabha. Nibabha. Condition. Condition. Svena. Svena. By your own. By your own. Karmana. Karmana. Activities. Activities. Kartum. Kartum. To do. Na. Na. Not. No. No. It just is. It just is. You like. You like. Yat. Yat. That which. <coughs> that which. Mohat. Mohat. By illusion. By illusion. Karisha se. Karisha se. You will do. You will do. Avashaha. Avashaha. Voluntarily. Voluntarily. Api. Api. Even. Even. Tat. Tat. That. That. Translation and purport by his divine grace, Siva Kivinata Shami, Shri Prabhupada Ki. Jai. <coughs> Under illusion, you are now declining to act according to my direction, but compelled by the work born of your own nature. You will act all the same, O son of Kunti. Fourth, if one refuses to act under the direction of the Supreme Lord, then he is compelled to act by the modes in which he is situated. Everyone is under the spell of a particular combination of the modes of nature and is acting in that way. But anyone who voluntarily engages himself under the direction of the Supreme Lord becomes glorious. Under illusion, you are now declining to act according to my direction, but compelled by the work born of your own nature, you will act all the same, O son of Kunti Mukam Kruti Vajla Mangamunai Tekrimya Krik Dhammande Shri Guru Nidhatarma. So this is uh, following very closely the theme of the previous class I gave, Brahmakund, Bhagavatam class, in which I was discussing the first and the second nature of each one of us. So our first nature, or our actual nature, the original nature, is spiritual. And our second nature, as Prabhupada used to state, and this is also a common saying, habit is our second nature. So in this verse, the first word is svabhava. So svabhava, Srila Prabhupada sometimes translates as instinct. So the word instinct, it's explained in some way by scientists as a scientific meaning. The Vedic explanation of instinct as given us by Srila Prabhupada is that it is habit which is very deeply ingrained in us, which is actually carried over from previous lifetimes. Just like we have instinctive preferences, instinctive attractions, we uh, like a certain kind of color instinctively. Nobody taught us that you should like orange or red or green as your favorite color we like it, uh, or certain kinds of tastes, or we like to be in certain kinds of places. Some people like to be in the city, other people can't stand the city, they want to be in the country, 
etc. Cetera, et cetera. So, uh, there are so many instincts. Robert gave the example of uh, of newborn babies of any species, take human species or lower species also. So uh, the baby human or baby creature is just born. So even the eyes aren't even open yet. This, this uh, baby has learned nothing in this lifetime. Just been born. But still instinctively the baby knows how to suck the mother's breast to take food. So you, the baby isn't taught that, nor can the baby be taught that at all. You can't. How can you teach a baby this? How can you explain to a baby that this is how you should eat? There's no question. But by instinct, the baby knows. So Shiva Prabhupada said that instinct is a deeply grained habit. Ultimately, of course, the source of this is the super soul. You can see in this nice uh, diorama depiction, the super soul situated in the center of every atom. And the same super soul, four-handed form of Vishnu Paramatma, is within everyone's heart. And he's giving, as he explains in the 15th chapter of Bhagavad Gita, knowledge, remembrance, and forgetfulness. So even if we haven't learned anything in this lifetime from a teacher, we don't even know how to talk. Still, there is what scientists call, inst uh, call instinct, which is ultimately the knowledge and the remembrance uh, and also the forgetfulness coming to us from Paramatma. So, uh, each of us is, con because of our conditioning, under co various combinations of modes of nature, three modes of nature, so they combine in various ways specifically to every person. Every person has a certain percentage of goodness, certain percentage of passion, certain percentage of ignorance. And so according to that unique conditioning, and then each of us it has what is called svabhava. Svabhava means, again, instinct or a nature, a tendency. And it is, as Prabhupada uses the word, involuntary. It is involuntary. And so he's speaking specifically to Arjuna. Arjuna is a chatriya. So in Vedic times, Chatri, of course, means warrior. But he is a warrior not only by training, as are the young men and also some young women go in the army nowadays too. So they get this training, six weeks usually, crash course, how to be a soldier. Uh, but in the Chatriya, the Vedic culture, it's not only a question of just training, in this lifetime, but it is actually an instinct. The uh, soul who is born in that Kshatriya family line is there because of karma. So he's uh, carrying again, carrying over again in this lifetime a nature which he has picked up in so many successive lifetimes. So a Kshatriya's instinct natural activity <coughs> is to fight, is to be skillful in weaponry, but not only that. Actually, primarily a chatri is noble. And from the word chatriya, chatriya, uh, we get the meanings, uh, one who protects, uh, chat and trayate. That means hurt. And triate means one who gives shelter. So, or one who delivers actually. Triate means like in mantra also. One who delivers. So, he who delivers others from hurt by protecting them. Either a kind of passive protection, like a governmental protection. 
government management. This is also the field of the Chatris. But the aim is the same, to protect. So in a passive way or in an active way, if there's an attack, if there's threat, danger, then they defend. So this is a Chatriya. And so everybody, the Brahmana has a nature, the Vaishya has a nature, the Shutra has a nature. Everybody has a particular nature. You can use words like proclivity or again tendency. But this is again ultimately coming to us uh, by the impulse within from Paramatma according to our particular situation in the modes of nature. And this Swabhava is habitual. It is our habit. This is our second nature. So what, what Krishna is telling Arjuna in this verse is that this is your nature and you will act according to that nature but you have a choice. You don't have a choice as to how, as to what you will do, uh, you, will, you will act in this way. If, if you may not follow my instructions, but uh, still if someone insults you, if someone challenges you because of your nature, you will fight. So he's telling Arjuna, don't try to change your nature. Because Arjuna, propo his proposal in the beginning was that all oh, this this Kurukshetra uh, battle is very inauspicious. How can I fight with my own near and dear ones? Persons I grew up with, persons I respected my whole life. Even my own guru, Drona, is on the other side. So this is very inauspicious. So for a Chetriya, it's not, it's not a question of just saying, well, I don't like this fight battle in front of me. So I'll just go home. And Krishna you can arrange a better battle another day that I may come back. It's not like that. Because if a Chetri turns away from the fight in front of him, then he's broken with his dharma. As Lord Krishna explains all this in the beginning, that now you will, if you take this step you plan to take, you'll be dishonored. And honor is the fundamental quality of the Chatris. You cannot be dishonored. As when Prabhupada was in visiting Vrindavan uh, Dham in the early 70s with disciples from the West. At that time Prabhupada really didn't have any Indian disciples yet. So all these disciples were from, actually from the States. And uh, this was their first time in India, so they were not so uh, <coughs> acquainted with the culture. So there was one king, king of Maharaj of Jaipur. Now in India, these kings have been deprived by the, uh, the government, the government that took over India after the British pulled out. It was a democratic government. So uh, they united India to one entity. And before that time, before independence, during the British rule, there were many uh, kingly states in, the, in uh, the Indian nation, which were actually independent. Uh, they even had their own army, their own government. But they were uh, allied with the British crown. Actually, this is a more Vedic system, but in Kali Yuga, everything becomes degraded and therefore unworkable. So you may ask, why did this break up if it was so Vedic? Yeah, it was so Vedic in one way, but in another way, when people are not uh, qualified anymore to maintain the more Vedic type of society and government, then actually things become worse <laughs> because they use these positions for exploitation. And so then everything gradually just collapses and comes down to a total Shudra platform. So, anyway, so there were many kingly states, I think something like 600 uh, big and small kingly states. And so before the British 
in, in, before, during the British time, uh, these kings actually had real power. Now, after independence, uh, they don't actually have political power, but some of them have been able to maintain themselves in a kingly way. They still have their nice palatial palaces. And uh, they've managed to hang on, you can say, to the scent of monarchy. So Maharaj of Jaipur is one such person. So at least his nature is that of a Chetriya. And Prabhupada appreciated that. Because he had the Chetriya nature and, and the Maharaj of Jaipur is also a very pious Vaishnava. So that Maharaj tried to give Srila Prabhupada a donation of a silver singhasana. Uh, on which the, the altar for the deities. So it was delivered by truck to the place where Prabhupada was staying in Vrindavan. But the devotee who received the truck, he was asked by the men to sign one document, sign a receipt. But the devotee, having some little experience of India, knew and he, he was thinking that, oh, this is all very entangling. And who knows what kind of complications one will get in if one signs such a paper. And then I become responsible and, and so on and so forth. He was thinking, uh, because, you know, transactions in India, there are very often, there's very often cheating involved, some devious side to it. And one has to be very, very clever and probably was always having to teach his disciples this. That you are too simple, you know, you're giving away money like anything because you don't know anybody better. These people are cheating you. So Prabhupada had always warned them. So he was thinking like that, that there might be something wrong with the Singhasana son, but I signed for it and then there's, and we just have to accept it. So he refused to sign. And because he refused to sign, then those uh, men who were delivering, actually they, they couldn't deliver. They were under orders to get a signed receipt. So then it was a kind of a stalemate and the, the men finally, after a lot of discussion hanging, finally the men just packed up the truck, Singhasana, everything, and drove back to the Maharaj of Jaipur's uh, palace. And so then Prabhupada, a little later he inquired, uh, was the Singhasana delivered? And then Prabhupada came to know what happened, and then he told this disciple that, oh, now you've insulted the king. Because actually, the, this is another aspect of Chetriya Dharma, he's to give uh, to sadhus, to saintly persons, to brahmanas. He's to give in charity. This is one of the uh, great pillars of Chetriya Dharma. But if the gift is refused, then that is a great insult. We never refuse a gift from a chantry. <laughs> so Prabhupada said, you have insulted, but this devotee couldn't understand. He was just thinking in terms of, you know, it's just a simple matter, just some, you know, little misunderstanding. So then he tried to go see the Maharaj of Jaipur at his palace, but he could not see him. The, the uh, servants of the Maharaj would not let him they told him, Maharaj is not here, they fight diplomacy and politics. But still the devotee was persistent, he knew he must be there. So he was waiting outside, waiting outside. And then all at once, uh, this was in the evening, suddenly the gate to the Maharaj's uh, inner palace, or his, the inner yard of the palace opened up, and the Maharaj's big, old, he had one of these old Rolls Royces from the 30s, came roaring out. And the Maharaj went driving off. The devotee was trying to, Maharaj, Maharaj! But he went. So then he could see, yes, actually he is insulted. He won't speak to me. He had been a great friend of the devotees, but now he was no longer speaking. So, yes, honor. This is the point, that honor is the basic principle for the Chetriya. So Lord Krishna was telling 
Arjuna, if you give up this fight, then you will be dishonored. Then your dharma is broken. And that's what Krishna explains, that they will, people will talk about you, they will say you're a coward, they will say you're unworthy. And for one who has been honored, one who has been in your position, and dishonor is worse than death, you'll not be able to live with that theme in Bhagavad Gita. You cannot change your nature. But the question, the question which is brought up very nicely here, the question of choice is this. And one can follow one's nature involuntarily out of svabhava, out of instinct, out of this long uh, sustained habit which goes back even into previous lifetimes. One can just go on and let that work on him or her. Or one can voluntarily, in Krishna consciousness, engage that nature in devotional service. And then this becomes one's first nature, because our first nature is we are devotees. So this is the choice, the clear choice that uh, Lord Krishna is presenting to Arjuna. Another way uh, to understand this is uh, engaging in one's natural proclivity or propensity with or without false ego. That is a choice. So, now we often have trouble when we're discussing this point. The devotees often have problem about the modes of nature and how they are affecting me. Because we think, well now I'm a devotee, a Vaishnava, I've been initiated, I understand that that means the spiritual master has taken my karma. So, by His grace, as long as I'm under His shelter, following the rules and regulations that He has given me to follow, and uh, executing uh, the order He has given me, the mission, then, by His grace, I am on the liberated platform. But, then, still this propensity, this svabhava still seems to influence me. In devotional service there's certain things that I prefer to do and other things that I don't like to do. Even there's some things which really I, I can't do. Which are all, you know, uh, very authorized activities. But there's some of these activities which I'm just really not able to to do, or at least I, I cannot do them regularly. I, I cannot imagine making this or that type of service. You know, for some people it's puja, to be a pujari. There's some devotees who just, they just, you know, it's their nature. To be pujari, they love it. They rise early, earlier than everyone else, and start to prepare for the Mangalarti and then awaken the deity and uh, make the offering, make the RT, and then do the bathing and the dressing in the morning. All of these devotional rituals, they just take to as if it is natural to them, and they can do this every day without fail. So, but there are many devotees yeah, well, I can do an RT once in a while. <laughs> but that, every day? <laughs> and then for others, it's book distribution. There are devotees who just accept the book distribution mission as their life and soul. And yet there are others who, who may go for some time, one, two years, and then they have a breakdown, and that's it. Sorry, I can't do this anymore. And they have to take another service. 
So then we wonder about this nature. Obviously there is some nature there that is still influencing us. And it's, it's our conditioned nature. It's the nature of our mind, the nature of our emotional makeup, the nature of activities that we like to do. So how is it if we are liberated but still we are influenced by apparently the modes of nature? This is a big question that always comes up. So the answer to this is it in the understanding of the dual meaning of the word guna, the three guna, the three modes. So guna is a word which is very rich in meaning. And one meaning is very, very nice, quality. Another meaning, rope. Rope, of course, signifies bondage. So both meanings are there in this one word, kuna. And how, how to determine the difference? The, di the difference, again, it's just a question of with false ego or without. If we perform activities without false ego, accepting a service given to us by the spiritual master. And he may have to... Uh, this is part and parcel of devotional service that the spiritual master is dis, uh, studying his disciples and he sees uh, the strengths and the weaknesses of his disciples. So he gives service accordingly. But the point is, as long as the service is authorized by the spiritual master, then it is a fact that that activity uh, is taking place on the liberated platform. No one needs to have some secret fear in the background that actually I'm, I'm completely in Maya, a conditioned soul, but my spiritual master has given me some, something to do with the way a master tosses some scrap to a dog <laughs> just so that I can feel, you know, I have a place somewhere. <laughs> but actually I'm I'm a karmi. <laughs> no. If we're actually following the process and doing what the spiritual master has said, even if, even after he's had to adjust it according to our particular nature, it is liberated activity. And so, but what about the gunas? Yeah, the gunas are there, but they're there as qualities. And we should understand them <coughs> not with goodness, passion, and ignorance. But when these qualities, these gunas, uh, are without the tinge of false ego, then they're to be understood in terms of jnana, dravya, kriya. This is from Bhagavatam, the teachings of Lord Kapila Dev. That prior to the false ego, prior to the influence of being covered by the false ego, the modes are there. The living entity is situated in the modes, but the modes are understood as jnana, is knowledge. That means a particular kind of knowledge that we have. Uh, but, uh, kriya, kriya means the activity which is natural to us, which we like to do. And dravya means the Dravya means uh, paraphernalia. The Dravya are the kinds of objects that we like to work with. Just like someone who has the, the jnana, the, the knowledge, the, the intel, uh, intellectual makeup, let's say, of a mechanic. And he has the Kriya, he likes to fix things. Mm -hmm. Something's broken, then in Polish they have this term, maybe not in languages too, but in Polish they have this term. Uh, 
golden hand or golden fingers. <laughs> and then check off. Yes. <laughs> so it means that anything is broken, this person who has golden fingers, he can fix it. He may not even have studied how to fix this particular machine, but he just, by instinct, again, it's Vavava, it's his nature. It's a machine, I can fix it. He understands the machine. So that's the point, the Dravya, then he feels, he has this Jnana, this Kriya, so therefore he feels at home, he feels very, he feels very uh, comfortable with machines, with technical devices and instruments. Whereas other people, you know, machine, <laughs> become very nervous, you know, you press the button, like, <laughs> you wonder, is it broken, what's it going to do next? <laughs> if it does break, then, you know, you just want to run out of the room. You don't want to, anyone to know that you were ever near that machine. <laughs> So this is Jnana Dravya Kriya. So we engage our Jnana, our knowledge, our Kriya, our activities, and also the Dravya. Dravya means again these things that we feel comfortable working with. Yes, for a mechanic it's machines, for a Brahmana it's books. He likes to read books. He also likes to do deity worship. He feels comfortable in that milieu. For a Chetriya, he feels comfortable in uh, governing, in speaking with authority. There's many people feel very uncomfortable. They're put in that position. We see this all the time in the Hare Krishna world. Sometimes it is necessary because of some special circumstance where you have to appoint one Prabhu, oh, you have to take charge of this situation. <laughs> very afraid of circumstances. It's a very simple thing, but they're just not just not their nature to tell other people what to do. To be in that position of, say, the boss. <laughs> and they feel very perplexed. Because they're the authority, then others are coming, what shall we do? And it's immediately a big problem. <laughs> so, anyway, these are our qualities. We have a jnana, <coughs> knowledge, we have a kriya, an activity, or activities that we like, and dravya, circumstances, paraphernalia that we feel comfortable with. So in devotional service, then, these three qualities are engaged in Krishna's service under the direction of the spiritual master. And this is not to be understood in, in terms of bondage. Now, the consideration of bondage, this is when the word guna takes on the meaning of rope, or also dosha. Dosha means fault. And Prabhupada said in, in devotional service, this is very, very important for us. When in our, in our dealings with uh, devotees, because we don't want to make Vaishnava Purana, is we must always distinguish between guna and dosha. Huh? Dosha again means fault. So it is not a fault, it should not be seen as a fault that a particular devotee has a nature, let's say, to be a mechanic if he is a devotee, if he is following properly the process, then we should not bring up the question of, you know, uh, this is a dosha, this is a fault, he's a shudra. Mm -hmm. Look up scriptural references, all the bad qualities. <laughs> <laughs> because it doesn't apply. It doesn't apply. You, and and uh, this is authoritative. It's very interesting when you look in the seventh canto, to Naramuni's instructions on the ideal society, or Narsham society. So you look at those verses where he's explaining uh, the qualities of each of the Varnas, Ramana, Chatriya, Vaishya, Shudra. You won't find any mention of faults. 
In fact, everyone is presented in the most glorious way you can imagine. You can realize by reading those verses that every one of them is a wonderful person, <laughs> full of good qualities. So, but yet, in other parts of the Shastra, we do find uh, faults mentioned. So what is the difference? So the difference is, again, it is the question of whether false ego is there or not. When false ego is removed, what does that mean? That means that this Brahmana Chaitri Vaishya should be the devotee. And as a devotee, that means he's situated directly on the body of the Lord. This Varda Ashram system, Chaturvana Maya system, what Krishna says, it is created by me. And we find in the Bhagavatam exactly how. It's manifested out of the, directly out of the form of Vishnu. Brahmanas are situated on Vishnu's head. Kshatriyas on his chest and his arms, Vaishyas on the belly, Shudras on the legs. So when you consider Varnashram in this way, it's called Daivi Varnashram. Daiva, it's God, Deva. Deva, Deva, the God among gods, that is Lord Vishnu, Lord Krishna. So Daivi means godly, godly Varnashram Dharma. The Varnas and Ashrams are situated on the body of the Lord because those in the Varnas and Ashrams are all devotees. Their activities in terms of the Varnas and Ashrams is devotional service. It's for the satisfaction of Krishna. It's not, it's not that they have selfish material desires, karmic desires which they are, so to speak, working out uh, by following Karmakanda section of the Vedas, you know, regulated activities, trying to perform pious deeds, avoid sins. No, that's not the that's not the sense of it at all. That is for the non-devotees. The Vaishnava is already situated in Brahmanism, Shiva Prabhupada says. What does that mean? That means he's following the regular the four regulative principles. No mediating, no illicit sex, no gambling, no intoxication. Chanting, 16 rounds, Hare Krishna Mahamantra. That means he's already situated in Brahma, right? according to Lord Krishna's own definition. Mamji Yogi Vicharya, Bhakti Yogi Rasevade, Sagunan Samiti Chaitanya, Brahma Bhuyaya Kampati. To be Brahma, Brahmana means to be in Brahmaputra, situated in Brahman. And Lord Krishna says that is accomplished by anyone who is fixed in devotional service without falling down. So then, everyone, every Vaishnava, he's a Brahmana, but still, he acts according to his preferential Jnana Dravya Kriya in the service of the Lord. Because that is the easiest for him. The point is, is to serve Krishna in love and devotion. So if you're struggling, see if you're placed in a situation which requires jnana, which you don't really have, you know, which is not natural to you. So you know you have you're reading all kinds of <laughs> books while you're trying to do this. <laughs> makes you very nervous, you're afraid of breaking things, and you know, so then it's hard, very hard. It's, it's harder to remember Krishna, it's harder, you know, to feel happy in devotional service, because you're struggling. So when the jnana dhavikri is according to nature, then you can just, you know, they say, think of cholo, just go, just go, serve Krishna, go back to Godhead. So that is the rationale of daivi on ashram dharma. So there's, not, there's no question of dosha, false. So Srila Prabhupada said, this is the vision of the devotee also. He said, you can see everything in two ways, the bright side and the dark side. That's possible because, because we are situated in this material body, we are in this material world, and in this world 
there is auspiciousness and inauspiciousness. So you can see things as guna, as good quality, or if you like, you can see things as dosha, as false. But Prabhupada said, we, meaning the devotees, we look on the bright side. We're always trying to encourage, this should be our duty, to encourage uh, everyone to take up devotional service. So this is, uh, refers to the example of the bee and the fly, the honey bee and the fly. The honey bee goes to the nectar. If someone is engaged in devotional service and our response to that should be very supportive, very encouraging, instead of going to the false, like the fly, the fly goes to the source and looks for false. So you're not doing this right, you're not doing that right. You're just a shudra. <laughs> This is discouraging. We should remember Lord Krishna's own explanation of what is perfection. Mukta Sangha Samatra. Samatra, uh, the word means to, to do perfectly. So, what is that perfect thing? To do everything for Vishnu in this verse. Uh, one should perform all of one's activities for Vishnu and that is perfect. That is not technical perfection. In this 18th chapter, what Krishna says, every activity is always covered by some kind of technical fault. You can never do anything technically perfect in this world. It's just not possible. It's even said that uh, there's even a story in the Puranas about Narada Muni. So Narada Muni, he is expert in playing veena and singing. So, he was once considering himself to, you know, he was, I don't want to say he was proud, we don't like to think that way about God, but he was just considering himself to be an expert musician. But he was shown, I don't quite remember if it was by Lord Vishnu himself or by Lord Brahma, his father, but anyway, he was shown that after one of his musical performances, he was taken to their particular demigoddesses who govern the notes of the musical scale. So they're responsible. Actually, each one of the notes is personified uh, by a demigoddess. So he was shown these demigoddesses after he was singing playing the Veena, and they were all crying and holding their arms and legs because he had injured them. <laughs> so, so from a technical point of view, perfection is not possible. <laughs> so the perfection is found in doing everything for Krishna. Dedicating our jnana, our knowledge, our kriya, our activities, and dravya, the paraphernalia, which we are engaging in devotional service. All of that should be utilized only for Krishna's pleasure. That is pure devotional service. That is perfection. And that is the quality, the qualification, which will get us back home, back to God. So this is what we should be looking for. Not, you know, not looking for faults, fault finding. Prabhupada said, anyone can find faults. He said, you can find faults in me, speaking of himself. Anyone can find faults, that's not great credit. But to see Krishna in everything, to see Krishna in everything, first of all, means to, that we have to be seeing Krishna in all that we do. As I said again, seeing that Krishna, he is the source of our object, is the source of our knowledge, and therefore he should be the object of our knowledge. Krishna is the source of our abilities, so therefore he should be the object of our abilities. Krishna is the source of all the paraphernalia around us, so he should be the object of that. 
that simple formula. If we practice that, then we will see Krishna everywhere. And we will see Krishna in whatever everyone else is doing too. Even on the advanced platform, one sees Krishna in the activities of the non-devotees too. But one also sees that these non-devotees are not Krishna conscious. All of their activities therefore constitutes a kind of imitation of devotional service. But all the elements are there. That's why Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati used to say, Prabhupada quoted him, but there's nothing lacking in this world except one thing, Krishna consciousness. That's all. Mm -hmm. Everything else is already there. It's not that there has to be some big, you know, upside down revolution. Everything is there in place. But what is lacking is Krishna consciousness. People are not doing their their life's work, their life activities for the pleasure of the Lord. So that consciousness must be fostered, must be developed, and that is the purpose of this Krishna consciousness movement. I'll stop here. Are there any questions? said that 90% uh, Prophet said that 90% of the people in Satyuga they were God conscious. So we, if you read the Shastra, you find there is some reference that there were also Varnas and Kings. But it appears that the maintaining of Varna Ashram, the maintaining of a society of a government was a very, very easy thing in those days. <laughs> because 90% of the people were saintly persons. <laughs> Only 10% had to be regulated in any way.
successful Manchu of the Vijaya and Bhakti of the Sevake, when one executes his devotional service without falling back. And Sarvanam Samiti Jaitam. Then, now this, this line of that verse can be taken in two ways. Sarvanam Samiti Jaitam can be taken as one transcends the modes. But another way it can be taken is that uh, one comes to the transcendental mode. Because the Supreme Lord, he has a name, Saguna. You see, the Mayavadis, they think God is near Guna, without any Gunas. It means he is zero, just a light. And there's no qualities. There's no knowledge, there's no uh, activity, there's no objects, none of that. It's just light. But no, God is Saguna. He is full of unlimited transcendental qualities, spiritual qualities. So these unlimited spiritual qualities, they can also be categorized in three. And Prabhupada actually says, he says in at least one passage I know of, that there are three modes of spiritual nature. Here, just as there are three modes of material nature, there are three modes of spiritual nature. And the modes of material nature are just shadows of the actual modes of spiritual nature. So the modes of spiritual nature are Sandini, Samvit, Ladini, Shakti. And they correspond. Uh, Prabhupada says there's a direct correlation between these three, or we, in simpler words, Satchit, Ananda, Eternity, Knowledge, Bliss. These are the three modes of spiritual nature. And there's a correlation between these three and goodness, passion, and ignorance in the material world. So then, to be, to come to the transcendental platform of devotional service, that means to come, to be situated in the, uh, this transcendental guna, sat, chit, ananda. In the spiritual world, there is also knowledge, uh, jnana, and dravya, and kriya. That is there in the spiritual world also, but it's all transcendental. So now we are, in this stage of devotional service, we are transferring between the two realms. And Prabhupada gives the example of uh, the caterpillar who is going across the leaf of a plant and he reaches over to another leaf. There's another leaf nearby. So if you see the caterpillar, they come along and they reach the end of the leaf and then they they stick their necks out and they wave their antenna around and then they finally touch the edge of this leaf. Ah, there it is. And then they start to move across. So, some part is on the transcendental side and some part is still on the material side, but that material side is the sattva goodness. So, you see, the thing is, is that there is no incompatibility. The mode of goodness is, while it's still material, it is compatible with spiritual activities. But Raja Guna and Tamil Guna, they're incompatible. So that is why Bhavana Ashram Dharma is so important for those of us here in the material world. That's in the mode of goodness. Whether, as I said, if our purpose in Varna Ashram Dharma is to serve Krishna, then it doesn't matter whether you are to be classified as a Shudra in the Shudra category or Vaishya or Chatriya or Brahmana. All of these are in the mode of goodness. All of these are in the mode of and Prabhupada writes that in general the whole Varna Ashram system is in the mode of goodness. But specifically, when our <coughs> Dharma is executed only for Krishna's satisfaction, it is in the mode of goodness and therefore compatible with spiritual activities, with the activities of devotional service. So the problem is, is when one is still maintaining a connection to the Rajaguna and the Tamil, then there's an incompatibility. And that is in the, see there's Daivi Varnashram, 
And then there's the, uh, or, or that we also say, what Prabhupada said, Nibriti Marga. You've probably heard of these terms, Nibriti and Pavriti. So Nibriti Marga, Prabhupada specifically said, Bhagavad Dharma. So dharma refers to the Varna Ashram. Bhagavad means it is God centered. It's just a synonym for Daivi Varna Ashram. It's another way of saying Daivi Varna Ashram Dharma. Bhagavad Dharma. So Nibriti Marga, what does Nibriti mean? Uh, Nibriti means uh, winding up the material existence. We are performing activities in this material world, but the aim is to end all material activities. That's Nibriti. The aim is to end all material. You, you can't stop acting, but there is a way to act that will end. As I explained the other day, uh, that we do not take birth again. This is called Naish Karma. Naish, it is karma. But when it, this <coughs> prefix Naish is in front, it means a kind of karma which will not lead to another birth. This karma will take you back home, back to God. So this is Nibriti Marga, or Daili Varnasham. And there's another kind of Varnasham, which is the Pavriti Marga. So Pavriti means it's the opposite. Nibriti means to wind up, wind up material existence, wind it up. Pavriti means to expand it, see? So one has very strong interests in sense gratification, but also some intelligence is there that uh, I want to get that sense gratification in a very orderly and predictable manner, you see? So I'll follow the Vedas. I'll follow the Vedas because that is knowledge given by Krishna, but my aim will be to enjoy it as the karmis are enjoying. To enjoy eating, sleeping, eating, defending. I'll just do it in a Vedic way. <laughs> <laughs> so this is Abriti Marga. And so at most, this is only, it only goes as far as the material mode of goodness. The Brahmanas in Abriti Marga system they're all impersonalists. So, uh, to this this idea of Brahmana, who is conscious of the impersonal Brahman, so he only goes as far, his nature only goes as far as the material mode of goodness, which is not steady. It's not steady. And I want to speak of the Chetris and the Vaishyas mm -hmm. As one goes down, one finds the, the tinge of Raja Guntama Guna increasing more and more. And it's also there even in the Brahmana in potential form. And for these these kind of Pravriti Marga Brahmana, they're the ones who get angry and curse and break their threads and <laughs> turn people into frogs. <laughs> because they're agitated. The agitation is the evidence of Raja Guntama Guna in the heart. They're agitated. So, uh, probably explain that materialistic people, those in this Pravitti Marga, and they're interested, they're, they're interested in the Vedic knowledge, goes only as far as Prabhupada said two things, uh, prophecy and medicine. Uh, prophecy means uh, Jyotir Shastra, astrology. So they go to Brahman, they accept Guru. They accept a Guru for that purpose. Guruji, tell me what will happen to me in the future. And then he does astrology. You'll meet a tall, dark man. <laughs> and also health. I'm having one pain. <laughs> And that is the extent of their interest. They all go to the Brahmana, to the authority in Vedic knowledge for these two purposes. So that's just to carry on in material life. That is their actual interest, just to carry on. Just to make plans according to the future. Uh, and to remain healthy. Why? So that we can uh, keep flapping. <laughs> <laughs> referred to this body like 
This material body is like a fish on land. You know, what does it do? It flaps. <laughs> <laughs> That's what material activity means, just flapping, <laughs> dying fish. So they want to just keep flapping as long as possible. <laughs> but Nibriti Marga means to use this body in a way that pleases Krishna. And the more we please Krishna, then again, to that caterpillar example, it's, it means the more the caterpillar is, the more of his you know, body, the more of himself is on that transcendental leaf. That is the test. The more we please Krishna, then the more we are on the Shuddha Sattva, the side of transcendental goodness. The more our our qualities, our jnana dravya, our gunas, jnana dravya kriya, are actually spiritualized because they're giving pleasure to Krishna. That's what spiritualization means. The more we know, starting with jnana, how to please Krishna, the more we do kriya to please Krishna. And the more of what we have around us in the way of possessions and paraphernalia, the more that is only for Krishna's pleasure, and the more we are established in the transcendental mode of goodness. Anything else? Yes? The varnas in the spiritual world, yeah, well, they're, they're all manifested uh, out of the Lord's Rup Shakti in Goloka Vrindavan. And Krishna himself is a Vaishya. <laughs> does that mean that he's some semi low class person who only has it together enough to herd some cows? <laughs> No, that is the Lord's own Swarup Shakti. That means his own uh, transcendental potency by which he enjoys himself. And in Goloka Vrindavan, there are Brahmanas like Madhu Mangal, Krishna's friend. Mm -hmm. he has a very, they have a very humorous relationship. There's a, a play written by Rupa Goswami, which the scene opens with. Lord Krishna with, I believe it's Madhu Mangal. Anyway, Brahmana friends, certainly. I think it's Madhu Mangal. And there's one thing about that's said about Brahmanas in estimating the nature of the different classes. Brahmanas are generally, they're, for some reason, they're not such good singers. <laughs> If you want to have a good singer, then you know, look to the Shudras or the Vaishyas. <laughs> so Krishna is in the, he's walking through the forest with his Brahmana friend, and then the Brahmana stops to sing a song. And, and then he sings, and you read in Rupa Goswami's uh, the, the dramatical narrative explaining what the actor should do that he sings in a very off-key way. <laughs> and then Lord Krishna is smiling. <laughs> but, you know, because Krishna is in the role of, this is all Leela, Krishna is in the role of a Vaishya boy, so he has to compliment the Brahman. So he compliments in a very funny way, a very bad way. You know, using language which has double meaning. <laughs> typical qualities, they're there in the spiritual world, but everything is there for the satisfaction, for the pleasure of Krishna. So there are Brahmanas in the spiritual world, there are Chetriyas also, uh, <coughs> Vaishyas and Shudras, but they're all there simply 
has Krishna's pleasure, his objects of pleasure. Whether, whereas here in the material world, of course, Brahmana, Chatri, Vaishya, Shudra, for conditioned souls, they have a very, very different purpose. For devotees, the purpose is the same, to give pleasure to Krishna. But for conditioned souls, non-devotees, very, very different. Prabhupada ki jai, Prasodha Maharaj ki jai.